Hello everyone, uh, it's good to see you all. Today we are very happy that we have uh, Herman Berlinde who is going to tell us about chaos in celestial holography. So Herman, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and and well, just an echo, yeah. Sorry, that was... Um, um, yeah, and certainly next time, uh, I hope it won't take too long before I get another invitation because uh, certainly um, UBC is one of my favorite places to visit. So we'll get another chance at some point, hopefully. Uh, what I'll talk about is, is um, work uh, I did with Sabrina Pasteski. It kind of flew out, came out of an earlier project uh, where, where we had been working on, on sort of um, yeah, the connection between soft degrees of freedom uh, and, and black hole information. Um, but uh, during that same period that we had the project on, on that black hole project, um, the development of celestial holography kept sort of uh, considerable momentum. And, and I thought, hey, it's useful, obviously, if we can extend holography in, in other space times um, than anti the situ space times. Uh, uh, and, and this maybe is indeed a moment where we have to start looking at if the lessons that we are learning in, in anti the city space have something to say about holography, indeed in flat space. There are important differences uh, and, and we'll see some of those uh, are coming about. Um, one of the differences currently is that of course, celestial holography is still in an early stage. So they're basically starting to build the dictionary based on partly on symmetries. Um, um, uh, whereas I think in, in, in uh, holography in, in anti the city space, one of the reasons why the last 10 years have been very interesting is that we've been asking questions about dynamics and entanglement, uh, and we'll see sort of the, 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 the interplay between symmetries and dynamics um, sort of coming into um, this um, work as well. So let me move to the next slide where it goes. Okay, good. So um, uh, so indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the symmetries of, uh, of, of flat space, um, again, that of course different, and perhaps we can think about them as a limit of the symmetries in anti the space, but I think there's still, it's still an important difference between um, uh, symmetries in, in, in Minkowski space and, and those in anti the space. And one of the reasons is that um, if you take, um, boost symmetry, uh, Lorentz symmetry, as an exact symmetry, um, then one of the consequences of that is that you're, you're actually able to uh, boost particles to arbitrarily high energies. Uh, and if you are in a theory of gravity, that's, that's clearly going to lead to um, pretty dramatic uh, effects. Uh, and one of the questions that one should ask is whether indeed the full Poincaré group um, uh, and the Lorentz and transformations and space-time translations, whether they indeed are exact symmetries of a, of a potential hologra holographic descriptions, or or whether they they might actually be, um, yeah, emergent. And 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 one of the reasons why why translations um, sort of are are uh, sort of dual in some ways to. Uh, Lorentz transformations is because of, as I said, once you start boosting a particle, uh, it will have a lot of energy. Uh, and and if Lorentz symmetry is an exact symmetry, you can have particles with arbitrarily large energy, and they will create shock waves. Um, and, and then how, does, how do those two things inter interfere is one of the themes of, of, of this talk. But anyway, let me just get started um, and, and sort of start with the basic presumptions or, or, or yeah, starting um, uh, hypotheses that go into celestial CFT. Uh, so let's assume indeed that we have something like Minkowski space. We have some kind of theory in, in Minkowski space. It has a scattering matrix. Uh, and then part of the idea of celestial holography is indeed to make the Lorentz group the, the exact symmetry, uh, but then map that to the conformal symmetry uh, of something that uh, then can be called the celestial sphere. And indeed the basic observation is that the Lorentz group is SL2C uh, and uh, um, the global conformal transformation acting on a sphere um, uh, are, is also SL2C. And there's a very nice way at least of, of sort of uh, imagining how this would work. Uh, suppose I would 
sit and, they, uh, and it's it's a dark night and i'm looking at all the stars uh, and i would boost i would go g- give myself a velocity and it would approach sort of something finite relative to the speed of light then all the stars will actually start moving they will no longer be at the same position but the way in which the stars are moving is actually by a conformal transformation um uh, so, so in that aspect, uh, yeah. So, so Lorentz transformations literally map to conformal transformations on the celestial, uh, on the sky, if you think about it that way. Uh, and that motivates sort of a, a reformulation of, of the S matrix, where you would take particles with a given momentum, uh, and you try to map them to the point on the sky in, in which they are headed, uh, basically where they go out. Of course, this picture on the left is is scry. Uh, plus and square minus, at least this is the, the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. Uh, and, and, and this dictionary indeed uh, involves both then uh, uh, an identification between operators between the past, which can be at certain points uh, on the sphere and particles in the future, which can be at other points. So there are two types of operators, the in and the out operators. And the idea is that the scattering matrix would actually be matrix element would then be a correlation function of the corresponding CFT. But um, again, as I already introduced in the, in the beginning, is that let's, let's, let's take this dictionary seriously and let's see if the, we can kind of give some kind of physical uh, yeah, significance to this particular sphere and imagine that there is some kind of local dynamical system that lives on that. Um, sphere and that system should be conformally invariant because of the uh, Lorentz symmetry. So in practice, the way this works is that you take the uh, need uh, parameterization uh, in terms of some complex coordinate Z, which is just some projective coordinate on the, uh, thinking about the sphere as a projective uh, yeah, um, space. Um, and then uh, the momentum has also an overall prefactor, which is omega, which you can think of as the, either the energy or it's just a prefactor in front of the uh, the four momentum, uh, and then uh, indeed the boosts um, may act if once I fix this location q mu, which is sort of like a unit vector, if you wish, um, then the boosts in that direction will just rescale omega, uh, and and then if you want to put a local operator there with a given conformal dimension, you want to diagonalize then that boost operator. And doing that is done through the Millen transform, where if you integrate uh, over that omega parameter uh, with omega to some power, you're projecting basically onto a wave function, part of the wave function that has a given conformal weight. Uh, so this is the dictionary. You take an, uh, a scattering amplitude, which depends on a, a bunch of momenta, but I'm going to label those momenta by omegas and z's. You do the Mellon transform and you get some object that depends on the z and z bars. And the idea is, okay, to what extent can we then use the power of conformal field theory to analyze the properties of these correlation functions and relate those to properties of the uh, um, scattering amplitudes and vice versa, uh, of course. And this has become turned out to be a, a quite powerful way of thinking about symmetries because basically what happens is that uh, once you have certain symmetries, some of which are things that perhaps are part of the quantum field theory that you're looking at, other symmetries may be actually symmetries of space-time, um, uh, and and they 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 will then uh, imply the presence of currents on the side of the uh, two-dimensional CFT, and then uh, the relationship between amplitudes, which are often then in the form of soft theorems, then become ward identities of the CFT. And the other important uh, insight is that um, basically once you have gravity, so and here, so adding gravity, up to now gravity didn't necessarily play a role. You can do this for any quantum field theory. But once you add gravity, then there are certain local, you know, certain variations of the space-time metric that from the point of view of the CFT amount to inserting a local stress energy tensor. So the fact that this holograph holographic dictionary actually leads to a, a seemingly local CFT on the celestial sphere uh, is essentially a consequence of, of gravity. So gravity in that respect is, becomes automatically part of this uh, framework. So those are introductory comments. Are there questions at this point? No?
Yeah, maybe just a, <clears throat> a question. Um, if if you, I guess if you had a, a supersymmetric bulk theory, so so with various amounts of supersymmetry, then I, I guess then you would expect this CFT to be promoted to some kind of super conformal theory. Is that? Yeah, I assume that. Yeah, that seems a pretty safe assumption, and I think it's actually an interesting sort of yeah direction to to explore. Yeah, I was wondering. Right. Are the are the relevant algebras understood that you would need to get to, if you had a maximally supersymmetric um, flat space theory? Uh, is it is it one of the standard kind of superconformal algebras? Right. Uh, it turns out that that the yeah I think so that probably should yeah it's true that the glow it's still uh, you can check this right so if you take the extended superconformal algebras and you look at the global sub mm. group of them would they be the uh the super extensions of the lorentz group i think that part is still true mm -hmm. uh, again as, as you'll see later um, um um one of the outcomes of this this whole program is precisely that it turns out that this cft has many more symmetries than you might have actually expected mm -hmm. even um, so it even goes beyond the sort of the more obvious space-time symmetries but it does seem that that super symmetrization should work. Although let me make one uh, comment, by the way, which I think should already be important, is that the unitarity of, of representation, yeah, so you have symmetries and unitary representations of it. And one of the questions you should ask immediately is, is whether unitarity means the same thing in both, uh, right. in both sides of the duality. Uh, because one of the more tricky parts of the whole mapping here is that in ADS-CFT, this is one of the powers of ADS-CFT, is that you could say that the bulk the, the Hilbert space of the bulk theory is identified with the Hilbert space of the CFT. Uh, and indeed, because in ADS space you have a time like boundary, the time evolution in the CFT and the time evolution in the bulk kind of are hmm. go hand in hand. That, that's not quite as obvious here, um, uh, whether the notion of unitarity from the point of view of the celestial CFT means anything relative to the, but this is part of the next thing I'll introduce because indeed I want to start looking at the CFT as an actual dynamical system. So I mm -hmm. want to be able to introduce a Hilbert space uh, and potentially use an operator state correspondence and things like that to, um, uh, to think about the dynamics of the CFT itself. Okay. Are there questions? These are presumably not the same kinds of CFTs that come into ADS CFT at, or otherwise a, a priori not but but for, so one thing i should mention and, and actually this is one maybe one of the main uh, new new kind of results in, in our in our discussion is that we have a way of introducing a central charge in this discussion mm -hmm. uh, and up to now although there have been many papers written about uh, celestial CFT, one of the open questions was actually how should one think about the central charge and we actually mm -hmm. have a proposal for that okay because central charge obviously as you know plays an important role uh, in um, uh, yeah, dynamics of a CFT. Anyway, still formalism, still briefly, uh, maybe I could skip almost this, but anyway, if you want to make a map between the bulk and the boundary, and you want to start making some kind of mapping between the Hubbard space, then you could say the following is that, suppose that I have some kind of uh, wave function in the bulk, um, and this is going to be basically, you can think about as maybe as the bulk to boundary propagator between the bulk point uh, which is big X uh, and a boundary point, which is little z. Think about this object big phi as the bulk to boundary propagator. And what you want is basically that this phi is an appropriate intertwiner of the conformal group, meaning that if I do a Lorentz transformation in the bulk, that it translates into a, an appropriate uh, conformal transformation on the boundary. And that's what this equation tells me. Uh, and what that means is that if I would have some kind of bulk operator, which is O hat, and I and let's for a moment assume that this bulk operator is some kind of effectively a free field, or asymptotically, at least it should be a free field if I think about it as an asymptotic state of an S matrix, then I can take the, Klein, the corresponding Klein-Gordon inner product between this function phi, which depends on X, and that operator O, which also depends on X, then I get an operator that only depends on the boundary. Uh, and this you can think of as being sort of the analog of the HKLL prescription, where you have a mapping between bulk, op bulk operators and boundary operators. Uh, uh, so that's, 
And then in the, uh, again, so one thing to keep in mind is that that this delta then is essentially still a, um, a, a thing that keeps track of the momentum, uh, part of the momentum of this box state. Uh, so one thing to uh, indeed then that happens is that this delta um, cannot just assume to be a, a real number. Uh, it turns out that the type of representations that you need here are, uh, yeah, in this case, actually unitary representations of SL2C. Uh, and those unitary representations, if they are part of this, what's called continuous series representations, um, then uh, the corresponding um, analog of the of the spin of the SL2C trans, um, transformation is complex. It's one plus i times lambda. Uh, so this is already. Can, can I ask can I ask a yeah. question here? So this surface uh, sigma is what now? It's not space like, right? Or this space -like? Is, in, in this case, it is a space like slice. So it's, if you assume okay. indeed that the, that the slice. Uh, reach a sort of what is uh, spatial infinity. It could be any arbitrary slice, at least if it's uh, a solution to the Klein Gordon equation, this O. But essentially, this is a, an initial mapping between the bulk and the boundary. This mapping will not play a, a completely crucial role in, in, in our story, but it's at least it gives you intuition that there should be a way of identifying um, um, operators in the CFT with operators in the bulk. Uh, so there's still a bit like the HKLL dictionary, but then one question one should ask again: still, what what does uh, how does time evolution act on this thing, and how does that translate into time evolution in the book? And that's sort of where I go next. But um, uh, a warning already is that the conformal dimensions here indeed are going to be complex and continuous. That is labeled by, in principle, a continuous label lambda. Any questions here? So here's at least a, a picture. And I should mention indeed, so some of the ideas um, that go into celestial holography were anticipated in a paper by De Boer and Soledukin, uh, like close to 20 years ago, where they, they looked at um, a, a Minkowski space and they basically said, well, there's actually a way of slicing Minkowski space where the spatial slices over here are basically empty to sit the space, have negative curvature. So these are empty to sit the slices. These things here are, are the sitter slices. Uh, and they meet uh, essentially over here at a point at infinity. Uh, and that point at infinity, which is uh, on scribe plus, um, is going to be basically the celestial sphere because this is, uh, again, the Penrose diagram. Uh, and any point on this Pen Penrose diagram is a sphere. So geometrically, we should essentially be thinking about the celestial sphere as sitting at this point. Uh, we could also move it around here. So you, you might think that, that the S matrix or the, 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 the asymptotic states in an S matrix live on the whole scribe plus. But part of what's happening is that this, this U direction that sits here basically gets absorbed into the spectrum of the CFT. It's a little bit like the, the CFT is like a, like a KK reduction, but it's a, K, it's a null reduction. Uh, of, of what sits on uh, on scribe plus uh, and all the information that sits on scribe plus is encoded still on that sphere um, and the um, again the conformal dimensions basically are, are a proxy for the momentum in this direction but uh, but the way in which that translation uh, works involves the melon transform so one thing to keep in mind uh, is that actually if you if I start translating in this direction, that translation is not a geometric um, symmetry of the celestial sphere itself. But translating in the null direction, uh, if I take an infinitesimal translation in the null direction, um, uh, it turns out that uh, that's like differentiating with respect to this omega parameter, because omega is actually can also be identified with that null momentum. Um, sorry, uh, uh, it's it, Am I saying this correctly? But if I differentiate back to omega, I'm reducing the power of omega by one, which means that I'm reducing the conformal dimension of operators by one. So, so the translation in the u direction doesn't act on a given primary field, but it maps one primary field to another primary field with conformal dimension one less or one more. Now, 
in conformal field theory, what we would typically do is we would do radial quantization. So let me go towards the sort of this uh, uh, sort of operate the state correspondence, and let me try to associate a Hilbert space to the CFT, which means I'm choosing some south pole, I'm choosing a north pole, and then the, my time direction in the two-dimensional CFT will go up. My spatial direction again is my space where my Hilbert space lift lives. Uh, if I choose a north pole and a south pole, I've chosen a direction. And then the, the conformal generator that brings me from the bottom to the top, which is the L0 generator, um, actually from the point of view of space time will amount to a, performing a boost. Uh, and indeed, since I've chosen that direction, I have a direction in which I'm actually applying a boost. So an observer, if you wish, that stands uh, at rest relative to the time evolution generated by this L0 operator, from the point of view of the bulk, is essentially a Rindler observer. Or if you wish, I should have drawn here this time slices of, uh, of uh, constant time slices of Rindler time evolution. And those constant time slices are being obtained by relative boosts. So if I'm going to associate um, a, a dynamics to the CFT, it's going to be the dynamics of a Rindler time evolution. And um, uh, and that's already in the first indication that uh, that there's going to be some kind of chaos, or at least around the corner, or some kind of exponential growth uh, of of um, of perturbations. Uh, because again, a Rindler observer will have an horizon, so this is the horizon of that particular observer. Uh, and then, then if I uh, yeah, maybe I should go to this slide now. Uh, then if I would be sending in the particle. Uh, something dramatic would happen, namely that that any particle, and this is sort of basic, the same setup as in as in ADS CFT as well, that any particle that was sort of essentially initially close to the horizon, and would come out, and would meet the Rindler observer at a given time, if I have some other perturbation that's being sent in, let's call this thing B, because this basically is the butterfly that would uh, disrupt the trajectory of this particular outgoing particle and it might move it behind the Rindler horizon. Uh, uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why, why celestial holography has some kind of intrinsic, you can either call it an instability or some kind of Lyapunov type instability, because uh, again, they're going to be, there's bulk gravity, there's going to be back reaction, and there may be uh, and a, a Shapiro time delay because of that shock wave. And that thing will grow. The, the effect of that time delay will grow exponentially in time. Uh, Herman can ask again uh, something here. So, doesn't this uh, shock wave that shifts essentially the coordinate u also cause a shift in the space of deltas? Because you said that, you said that as you shift u, it's analogous of shifting essentially deltas. That's right. So, so this is precise. But, but the fact that it's uh, so it's a very good question, and this is sort of part of the essence of the whole story, um, uh, because basically. Um, uh, indeed, the, uh, this operator B will generate a shift, um, and, and that shift is represented indeed in a shift in the deltas. Um, but it's rather strange to be thinking about a symmetry gener generator in the CFT as something that's shifting the, the conformal dimensions. That's already a first strange thing. A second comment is the following, is that if I have um, an effect um, um, in the, CFT, in the CFT, and that effect grows exponentially in time. And I would multiply an operator by that exponential, because, for example, I do the commutator between two things. And the commutator on the right-hand side has an exponentially growing function in front of the whole thing. And then I Fourier transform then the fact that I'm multiplying it by an exponential of time looks like a shift in the conformal dimension. So the shift in the conformal dimension is sort of an indication that this, uh, that this effect of the translation is actually um, potentially even a, a dynamical effect in the form of a Lyapunov behavior and that the exponential growth of the Lyapunov behavior in terms of some low energy effective description 
looks like a shift in the same way as that in ADS CFT, right? The, uh, the, the, the translation symmetry in ADS CFT that sits near the black hole horizon is an emergent translation symmetry. It follows from the dynamics of the CFT that, that there is this emergent region near the class, near the black hole that 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 has seeming translation symmetry and certainly the shockwave uh, uh, interpretation is something that's that's a dynamical and an emergent interpretation uh, so that's the physical intuition and, uh, and we'll try to see if we can make this more concrete uh, sort of given in the formalism of the of celestial cft let me briefly look at my previous previous slide if there was anything useful in the previous slide okay it was just simply saying that if if once i have this picture uh, it was sort of the same picture I had before, indeed, that uh, the, the time translations uh, in the radio quantization go this way. Uh, indeed, uh, the coordinates, I'm not sure if you guys can see this uh, this equation here, but the coordinates indeed are then parameterized sort of essentially in, in terms of tau and phi, uh, where tau is the radio coordinate. Um, the Hamiltonian, again, is this L0 operator. And um, and the basic idea is that that this tau, in some sense, or this t, which basically is shifting this value for tau, if you wish, um, um, uh, is is so t is the yeah the, the amount by which I go in the tau direction um, can be thought of as as winter time evolution. That's the idea. Now, okay, let me um, now I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, so one of the surprises a little bit is that if you, once you go to a um, uh, Rintler observer, uh, the Rintler observer would see something at finite temperature, uh, whereas celestial CFT doesn't know about temperature apparently, right? You're just in flat space, there's no such thing as temperature. Uh, and, uh, and there doesn't seem to be a periodic time direction, Euclidean time direction yet. But it turns out that celestial CFT actually has quite naturally uh, a, a periodic Euclidean time direction. So there's there's even a little bit the analog of a uh, Gibbons Hawking type argument uh, here. Uh, and now Gibbons Hawking would tell you, okay, well, okay, there's uh, uh, if you if you do the path integral, um, often the, you want to go to Euclidean signature as a way of finding the right uh, saddle points. Uh, it turns out that if you do an S matrix uh, setup, of course, going to Euclidean signature is not a great thing to do because you, you cannot do on shell scattering in Euclidean signature. So in most um, um, uh, of the literature, uh, often people go, go to 2,2 signature as a way of defining amplitudes. And it turns out that in 2,2 signatures, many of the amplitudes are actually better behaved in 2,2 signature but then you define them first in 2,2 signature and then you analytically continue to 3,1 signature. So um, and this is something that also Stromager and collaborators started doing and they wrote a very nice paper where they indeed analyzed the, the setup of, of um, a celestial holography in 2,2 signature. Uh, and then they found something that's actually the, uh, the, what they call the celestial torus. Now, uh, why is it the torus? Um, basically, if you go to 2,2 signature, and again, uh, on my own slide, I, I'm, uh, maybe I should move this thing here to more towards the side, yeah. Here we go, now we're on the bottom. Um, so, so here, this is a 2,2 signature Minkowski space, but I'm basically introducing two polar coordinate systems. Uh, and, um, uh, and then I need to have two angular coordinates. Uh, and those two angular coordinates are really the coordinates on scry, because essentially scry, which is the, the, the null infinity in 2,2 signature, is obtained by taking these two radial coordinates and sending them to infinity. And, uh, and then and the psi is periodic with 2 pi, phi is periodic with 2 pi, and that parameterizes now something that we call the celestial torus. Um, now let's try to go back from 2,2 signature to 3,1 signature. Uh, and one way of doing that is to do the following is let's suppose that I um, want to um, uh, 
multiply q times i so then q goes these two minus signs become a plus sign so then i go from 2 comma 2 to uh, 4 comma 0 signature and then i go to euclidean signature but i'm also going to then put an i in front of psi so so i claim that uh, analytic continuation to to 3 comma 1 signature indeed uh, would indeed put the i in front of q but psi is then indeed the euclidean Rindler time So psi becomes naturally the Euclidean winter time and the periodicity and psi is indeed the periodicity of the Rindler periodicity. Uh, and, um, and therefore indeed correlation functions that one is going to compute on the celestial sphere as a function of tau of the, of the Rindler time tau will indeed have naturally the periodicity uh, in, the, in, the, in the time direction. Uh, and that, is naturally incorporated in this um, um, way of thinking about celestial CFT. So it's important. So the lesson, main lesson here is that celestial CFT both lives on the celestial sphere, but it, it basically has also a, a version which probably is the better version uh, that lives on the celestial torus. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Now, there's something funny about this celestial torus. It turns out that celestial torus, uh, let me see how I'm doing with uh, my, there we go, right, uh, is obtained indeed by, by this analytic continuation. This is what I mentioned, where the celestial real time is being complexified, basically. And then you go to the other real slice. This is how you go back and forth between the, the sphere and the torus. Um, and, um, one lesson which one should perhaps be worried about it turns out that the celestial torus if you think about it uh, actually has a one comma one signature so one of the coordinates is time-like the other one is space-like they're both periodic so one danger that you seem to we working with here is that you're working with a space that seems to be periodic in time. At least there's, there seems to be close time-like curves if you wish on the celestial torus. Another uh, relevant comment is that if I would think about the celestial torus because it's two-dimensional as a space on which a two-dimensional CFT lives, then um, if you want to think about what its tau parameter is, in the in the sense of uh, the shape of a torus, uh, its tau param parameter is in some sense degenerate. So basically, from the if I if I define q as e to the two pi i times the tau parameter of the torus, I apologize for having tau here. Also, previously my tau was Rindler time. This tau is the tau parameter of the torus. The the e to the two pi i tau of the celestial torus is actually equal to one. So it's a, it's a degenerate limit of the, uh, of the torus parameter. Okay. Okay, so uh, let, me see, let me continue. So now this is one part of the story. This is sort of the geometry of celestial holography. Now I'm going to go to another part of the game where people started thinking about asymptotic symmetries. This is where as part of celestial holography got started, looking at basically asymptotic symmetries of the citrus space. I'm sorry, of, of Minkowski space, um, uh, and then uh, identifying uh, sort of the dynamics of the CFT, um, basically, or at least the symmetries of the CFT uh, based on the asymptotic behavior of the Minkowski metric. So let me still ask if there were questions about the previous, because otherwise I'm going to go to the next topic, which is essentially um, indeed the way people were studying asymptotic um, null, if, oh yeah, yeah, the metric near null infinity. Um, again, there are old papers by uh, Bondi, Metzner, and Sachs uh, who identified the, the, the BMS symmetry group. Uh, and again, one of um, Stromer and collaborators' deep insight was that this BMS symmetry group had to do with the soft theorems uh, and that one can capture a lot of those um, 
symmetries, uh, and indeed in terms of ward identities of this two-dimensional CFT. Uh, and again, these equations look a little bit daunting, uh, but the main thing to keep in mind is that, that uh, essentially you can both sort of um, have things that are called super translations where, where essentially you have symmetries, which are the Poincaré symmetries, uh, but then you can um, make them local basically on the celestial sphere by having them depend on the location of the celestial sphere. One of the key reasons for why celestial CFT is a powerful framework is that there's another set of symmetries which are called super rotations, which are local generalizations of Lorentz transformations. Uh, and they act like conformal transformations on the celestial sphere, meaning local conformal transformations where I take an arbitrary function of the coordinate Z on the sphere. I do the usual local conformal transformations uh, and therefore, there's a symmetry algebra, which would be the Virazoro algebra that incorporates symmetries that are part of the um, symmetry group, asymptotic symmetry group of gravity. So here's a, a vector field indicated this psi sub y, which is the basically um, a, a symmetry that uh, on the primary fields of the CFT acts exactly like the conformal transformation of a CFT, two dimensional CFT. Are there questions about this statement? So then you can ask, okay, well, if you have the symmetry, what's the generator of that symmetry? Now, from the point of view of gravity, you can ask, what's the um, uh, current that, um, when you would look at the canonical structure of gravity through commutation relations would generate this particular transformation? It turns out that there's a particular mode of the graviton, which is then naturally the, the stress tensor of the CFT. The C is, uh, is called the, the news tensor, I guess, uh, and it's one of the components of the metric. You define this combination. There's some subtlety. This is called the shadow transform, where you have to do this particular integral. But think about this still as a local operator in the celestial CFT, a local op operator on the celestial sphere. If you write down the corresponding charges, it will generate essentially the Lie algebra of, of, of Repermutations on the sphere, and you get indeed a Virazoro algebra with zero central charge. Um, this is actually a little bit confusing for me uh, because CFTs with zero central charge are kind of special CFTs, uh, and 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 you would have thought maybe from the point of view of ADS CFT that the holographic theories would have large central charge. Um, and we're actually going to sort of um, bring these two intuitions a little bit closer together um, in a second, unless there are questions here. I'll go to the next slide. Is this okay? Mark, did you still have a question? You good? Good. So it turns out that if you look a little bit more closely uh, at sort of all the various components in the metric here, there's another component of the metric, uh, um, which, because you, you basically are looking asymptotically near the boundary of Minkowski space. So you have all kinds of fields that seem to live on the celestial sphere, but depending on how they depend on the other direction, the radial direction or the U direction, you can get many fields because basically if you start looking at the four dimensional fields, obviously you're gonna, and you dimensionally reduce the two dimensions, you're gonna get many components. One of those components is the linear and U dependent piece of this, uh, same object C, I'm going to call it theta. And it turns, that, turns out that this object theta under conformal transformations, under these super rotations, uh, transforms indeed as a stress tensor, basically. Uh, meaning it has this central charge term. This is the thing where we would normally identify the central charge. So if I now do this to, in terms of modes, if I take T, which is my original stress tensor, and I take this theta, I get the algebra here, uh, where, where I get a Virazoro algebra, C equals zero Virazoro algebra, but I also get this other object theta, okay? So this is the structure of celestial CFT, and it looks a little bit like what people have obtained, I guess, when you take this flat space limit of ADS. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this actually looks exactly like that. 
but um, the way I would like to look at this is indeed sort of as this thing as being a flat space limit of ADS, because indeed what you can do is by essentially um, taking the, uh, where you go, here we go, taking uh, these two combinations. So I introduced some parameter that I call epsilon and epsilon goes to zero later. And I take the sum and the difference of T and theta uh, and if I would postulate that these two things would satisfy these two Vera Zora algebras, and I send the uh, epsilon to zero, then the, this algebra in the epsilon to zero limit corresponds to the symmetry algebra that people extract from um, 2D CFT. So the, the presence of this extra mode theta, think about it as a Goldstone mode. This theta, by the way, is, it's a little bit similar to the Goldstone modes that appear in, again in, 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 in ADS CFT or, or in, in the SYK model. It's sort of the soft mode uh, of, the, uh, of the dynamics of this theory. But again, if you combine them in this combination, then the soft modes themselves uh, also generate still this algebra. Are there questions about this? Uh, can I ask a, a general question? So people have even discussed, uh, Andy, for example, even larger uh, symmetry algebras like W infinity, right? Yeah, yeah. So can, is this embedded inside W infinity or how do you view that? That's a good question. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, by the way, I'll probably run 10 minutes over if that's okay with you guys. Is there, is there a hard cutoff? No? I, yeah, we're flexible. Okay, good. I have a cutoff at 4.30, but uh, anyway, anything before that should work, or at least 4.20, I probably have a cutoff. But, okay. So, uh, and yeah, and I'd be happy to sort of, if there's sort of follow-up discussion, sort of to still be available at, an, at another time, but let me continue. Your question is a good one, and I'll get back to that. Uh, and uh, and I need, um, uh, let me just tell you what the current philosophy is here, is that, and this is maybe slightly unnatural from the point of view of celestial holography, but I think it's still important, is that the if we take the conformal symmetry of celestial holography seriously, and we take the Vera Zora symmetry seriously, then it seems very natural because one of the things that various people have understood, uh, and again, including many people sort of in the audience indeed, um, that um, that there are generic properties of, of uh, holographic CFTs, in, especially ADS3 CFT2, uh, where the emergence of uh, sort of chaos commutators uh, is very intimately connected with the uh, presence of Goldstone modes, and those Goldstone modes are very intimately connected with the presence of a Vera Zora algebra. Uh, but the, the Goldstone dynamics indeed looks very much like that of Liouville theory, but then you need a central charge. And in this case, indeed, here we have the central charge. So now we have two Vera Zero algebras that have a non-zero central charge. And they actually uh, will be the ones that will encode the, 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 the chaos behavior. So that's one part of the philosophy. But you're right that there's going to be many more symmetries. And then the question is, how does that fit in? How do those other fit symmetries? But the, this Vera Zero algebra is, is the conformal symmetry. Uh, and it's not contained in that W infinity algebra. It's that W infinity structure is orthogonal to this. Very quickly. Uh, so let's try to set up the formalism now to, to try to start computing out of time ordered correlation functions. And let's, let's start to think about what the celestial CFT looks like. Uh, and uh, let's work this from the, uh, on this uh, from the point of view of um, this 2,2 signature space time. Uh, and that the celestial CFT lives on the torus. If I take an expectation value on the torus, I can also think about it as an expectation value between two thermal field double states. It's like a thermal expectation value, this one. Uh, and then I need, even in ADS CFT, we would think about the thermal field double state as obtained from this integral uh, over half, basically, a, a thermal circle. But then we have the other circle, which is the spatial circle. Notice the following is that the celestial torus actually in some ways has imaginary temperature, but it also has imaginary um, energies. We're still going to get Boltzmann factors if you do this thing. 
Uh, so the claim is that if you compute expectation values uh, on the celestial tours of local operators, you can kind of view it like this. And this state here, uh, morally speaking, I would, would like to think about this as basically the representation of the state seen by the Riedler observer. Uh, and that uh, the Riedler observer indeed would see a mixed th state, which would only be the right state. And then this is the purification of the uh, state seen by a Riedler observer. That's how I would like to interpret this thermophile double. Then you basically just turn the same crank as that people have been turning uh, again in two-dimensional CFT. You can define, uh, basically you do the OTOC, you, you wanna look at the out of time under correlation functions. You act with two operators on the celestial, on the uh, thermophile double. You reverse the order and you, you compare the out of time ordered correlation function with the in time ordered correlation function. Um, at this point, if you assume that the Virazoro symmetries that we have identified uh, have basically are sufficient to characterize the correlation functions of the CFT in terms of conformal blocks, uh, and if you assume that um, uh, inappropriate regimes, and here again, you should argue based on the kinematics that the vacuum block, for example, will start dominating. Then you can basically carry over the same calculations that one would be doing in, um, in 2D CFT. Uh, the subtlety though, again, I should mention is that the central charge actually is imaginary. Uh, and I'm looking at operators um, that are charged under one of the two Virazoro algebras. Uh, the central charge is imaginary, and I should have emphasized that here again, is that this central charge here uh, is imaginary, but I have two Virazoro algebras, one with plus i central charge and the other one with minus i. And I'm going to be looking at operators that only are not, uh, um, interacting with one of the two Virazoro algebras. And I'm interpreting that as the algebra uh, associated with the asymptotic symmetry group of this ADS anti de Sitter slicing that the Boer and Solodokin already had identified. So it's basically, and we'll see, we'll see that in a second um, made more explicit actually. Um, and this is where I'm going now. So this is basically just back of the envelope for now, uh, a calculation you can do from the point of view of the CFT um, uh, and basically using the, the structure of the conformal blocks to argue that indeed uh, there is this Lyapunov behavior, basically by copying the same calculations that people have done in 2D CFT, being careful at least about some of the special properties of the celestial CFT, but once you have a few zero algebra with a large central charge, many of the things actually will um, uh, sort of still uh, happen in the same way. One slide, by the way, that I don't think have, I have, but it's in our paper, I should mention that precisely this limit where central charges goes to infinity is actually a nice limit to consider in, in even in ADS CFT. Uh, it's of course where the two dimensional CFT becomes sort of more classical, if you combine that limit C to infinity with uh, uh, basically this limit where you degenerate the torus in the way that one needs to do to obtain the celestial torus, it turns out that the partition function of the celestial CFT precisely reduces to the Schwarzschild partition function of the Schwarzschild quantum mechanics. Uh, and it's a consequence of papers that I wrote with Turiyachi and, uh, and Turiyaki and others, um, that if you take uh, a two-dimensional CFT and take the central charge to infinity and you compactify it on a, on a very small circle, uh, basically the, uh, the, Vir the effective theory of the, the Goldstone modes of the Virazoro symmetry turn into the Swatchen modes. So there's a Swatchen underlying some of this. I'm going to move a little bit faster through this part um, because I want to be able to say a few things about SYK and, and about W infinity at the end. But uh, in, the, in the next few slides, I'll explain from a geometric point of view, uh, how one can get the out of time order, the exponentially growing out of time ordered correlation function. Mm -hmm. 
turns out that the correct classical background um, that leads to the impulsive waves that lead to Lyapunov growth from the bulk perspective are also precisely uh, connected to the basically the type of back reaction that one can extract from the structure of the conformal blocks of the CFT. Uh, and it turns out that basically Penrose, uh, as usual, was already kind of early on uh, recognizing uh, uh, at least a lot of the, the geometric structure underlying all of this. Um, so basically the idea is that, okay, well, I want to compute a out of time ordered correlation function. I send in some, um, act with some particle, or some operator that sends in a particle, the particle will back react. Uh, and the back reaction is encoded in some transition function and the transition function, the parameter of the transition function is the soft mode that um, uh, captures the chaotic dynamics. The soft mode in this case is the super rotation mode, which is basically a conformal transformation. Uh, and the thing that Penrose already dis uh, discussed in one of these twister newsletters is indeed basically a shock wave where you have some geometry, which is just Minkowski space. It glues onto another Minkowski space geometry, but there's a coordinate transformation that goes between the two. Uh, and that coordinate transformation is a conformal transformation uh, from the point of view of the celestial sphere. Another way of thinking about that shockwave from the point of view of the slicing of the Boer and Solodukin is that what you're doing is you, you, you're, once you go through the shockwave, you're changing the slices from being pure ADS to a slice that has this Banyados deformation in it. So basically you can have asymptotic ADS space times that are essentially conformal transformations of standard ADS space time. And that's what you're doing here. Uh, and indeed, uh, the way it looks like is you have basically flat space, which is this first part of the metric. This could also still be part of flat space, but then you turn on off the diagonal components of the metric. And even Penrose already knew that those off the diagonal components of the metric were actually given by the Swatch and derivative of the conformal transformation. Penrose already, so yeah, let me jump over this. Um, basically, the idea is that those shock waves that I'm talking about effectively will start deforming the geometry of the celestial sphere. Although these are, although these are shock waves in the four dimensional bulk, if you think about how they affect the structure of the asymptotic symmetries and asymptotic space time, then it turns out that the asymptotic space time itself will actually um, get um, uh, deformed. Uh, and in particular, if you, for example, put a certain amount of stress energy at a certain location and you think about how it back reacts, uh, it generates actually a conical deficit. And the conical deficit indeed can be thought of as the result of doing a coordinate transformation, which is multivalued from the point of view of the uh, celestial sphere. Uh, and that multivalued coordinate transformation through the torch and derivative turns on this particular expectation value. And then from the point of view of the celestial CFT, this amounts to putting an operator with a particular conformal weight at that particular location. So what this is doing, it's basically creating a dictionary for uh, computing the back reaction due to the insertion of an operator on the geometry of the celestial sphere. Uh, and then Penrose already anticipated how you could scatter these things. If you do that from the point of view of equations, basically what's happening then is the following is that I want to compute basically the uh, the out of time order correlation function between an A and a B. The B object is the thing that generates a shock wave, but the shock wave is basically a back reaction that can be encoded in uh, a conformal transformation. The conformal transformation is of this type where you essentially create a small 
deficit angle at the location of the operator. The size of the back reaction is, is suppressed in the central charge. So this is actually one of the subtleties of our stories, I should say, is that epsilon goes to zero, but I need epsilon non-zero in this expression. And indeed, when you look at the, um, the commutator, you basically have to go to a, a second sheet. You pick up basically some kind of branch cut here, and you see that this operator B effectively shifts the location of the operator. Z, uh, A at the location Z, it shifts it by a tiny amount. But now if you keep in mind that Z is actually e to the power T, it turns out that that particular shift has an exponentially growing effect uh, in the time difference between the two operators. So basically this right hand side of the commutator uh, is indeed the, the same commutator that one would have in a, in a chaos situation in two-dimensional CFT. Um, it's proportional to epsilon, so it goes to zero if epsilon goes to zero, but it also grows exponentially in time. So then you have to ask yourself indeed, uh, which of these factors indeed uh, will win. But this is basically the Lyapunov behavior that's associated with the shock wave. Okay, so this was maybe a little bit quick at the end, but that's sort of the that was sort of the more technical part of the computation. Are there quick questions about this? Uh, then I'll take 10 minutes to discuss the SYK part of the story. No questions? Well, um, to continue the question before, uh, the shock wave normally in the bulk has TUU, right? Along the light con coordinates, not theta. Right. Yeah. So how did this, uh, this is what I lost. How did this got mapped just to ZZ bar? Right. Um, yeah, so it had to do indeed with, uh, yeah, let me briefly go back here. It had to do basically with um, this analytic continuation that took place here. So indeed, um, uh, uh, once you start complexifying the coordinates on the celestial sphere, because we go between the celestial sphere and the celestial torus, the celestial sphere starts knowing more about the space-time coordinates than you might have guessed uh, once you include the analytic continuation. But it's a good question. And we were confused about that for a while ourselves. Okay, so now let me um, summarize this. So I'll do, give a short version of the, the second part of the story, which I think is actually an interesting complementary kind of picture uh, on all of this, because basically it also goes quite back to the question that you were asking before about the, the, the extended symmetries. So what are the characteristics of, of a physical system? So that's again, part of the same theme. Let's imagine that the conformal the celestial CFT is a natural physical system. What, which physical system could do all the things that a celestial CFT would have to do? Now, so what are the main things that a celestial CFT would have to do? Uh, it would need to have a conformally soft sector, which is governed by the symmetry breaking dynamics of the asymptotic symmetry groups of the, of the gravity theory, which include Virazoro symmetry, the super translations, the W infinity algebra, basically, also. Because indeed, uh, Stromager found that there's a much bigger symmetry algebra. Uh, the effective uh, action of the super rotation modes actually reduces to uh, Schwarzschild quantum mechanics through this limiting procedure, and you want to get this Lyapunov behavior. So, what could be a system that does all these things? Uh, and uh, and um, yeah, this is not maybe too interesting. This was just basically how how um, uh, Strominger um, found these W infinity charges. He took uh, a graviton, uh, which is a local operator on the celestial sphere. He expanded it in powers of z bar. And then he uh, showed that these objects here basically uh, would satisfy this W infinity algebra. So this should be a, a, a feature of any system that um, realizes celestial CFT. Uh, I should mention that that this area, this W infinity, is the area preserving different morphisms. Um, it was already found in earlier. Um, studies of uh, in particular self-dual gravity uh, and also of MHV amplitudes in gravity uh, because basically if you expand uh, a self-dual background in, in, in four-dimensional gravity 
and you interpret those that expansion in terms of scattering of MHV amplitudes. There's a symmetry. Um, sorry, those are yeah MHV amplitude, and then the symmetry of the self-dual gravity equations will then turn into ward identities of these MHV amplitudes. Uh, and it was known that self dual gravity actually has a symmetry under area preserving diffeomorphisms, uh, but that turns out to be more evident if you go to twister space. So instead of writing it, uh, the self dual gravity solutions in real space, you have to go to twister space. That's a long story by itself. Uh, but then uh, once you are in twister space, then these currents that Stromager identified are just area preserving diffeomorphisms on that space. But now, uh, uh, one thing that we started discussing is that, okay, well, if we take this whole symmetry seriously, the area preserving diffeomorphism, is there a system that could do both? Have the, have the chaos and have area preserving diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, and it so happened that at least a couple of years ago with uh, Jorik and Turiaki, we, we had a, a proposal for a, a two-dimensional version of SYK, which had both symmetries. So at least we start we started investigating that. Uh, so the uh, the the model that we looked at um, looks like SYK. So it has the SYK interaction uh, and it the psi to the Q interaction, but it has two types of um, Majorana excitations uh, that are called psi plus and psi minus. Uh, and normally in SYK, it's essential that the kinetic term indeed is just psi, psi dot, uh, and that if psi is just uh, a dimension zero field, uh, that, the, uh, that the kinetic term is irrelevant relative to the potential term, that the potential term is the relevant interaction. Uh, and that's why just writing down two-dimensional um, uh, generalization of SYK is actually not quite doing it because in two dimensions, fermions have dim scale dimension a half, and then a psi to the Q interaction would be subleading, uh, would, would be irrelevant. So what we did is we introduced an extra field, which is this E field, which is a one form field. So if, if E is a one form, then the psi, the psi is also a one form, which means that psi in this action is actually dimension zero. So in this theory, um, uh, psi has dimension zero, and which means, uh, but we have a price to pay that this E is a dynamical field. Uh, and then the idea is that, okay, well, maybe in the infrared, then uh, and the, this interaction term still dominates and that the SYK kind of machinery can start working. So the SYK, SYK machinery is basically um, starts out by, for example, solving the Schrodinger Dyson equations. This is sort of what the SYK Schrodinger Dyson equations look like. But now there's this extra piece that has to do basically with the equation of motion of this E field. Anyway, I'll, I'll, it will not it will take too much time. So let me go quickly now. Um, so here we go. So what? How does how does one solve an SYK model? Uh, what you do is you introduce these collective fields, basically, which are bilocal. Uh, the, 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 uh, in this case, there's an other collective field, which is basically the collective field associated with that E variable. Uh, and if you just integrate out the uh, fermions, you can get an effective action for these um, collective fields. Um, and uh, one thing I should have mentioned here is that if you look at the symmetries of this action, so this, this UV action is reparameterization reper invariant in the same way as that the SYK action is reparameterization invariant. But now the reparameterizations are in two dimensions. But the interaction term doesn't have this covariance. Uh, it's just an integral over a, a two-dimensional area of an object that looks like a scalar. So this, this action actually has area preserving diffeomorphism invariance. So, so the fact that there should be a W infinity algebra popping up later is sort of cooked in already because this action has W has area preserving diffeomorphism variance. It will get actually slightly rearranged once you go to this bilocal formulation. 
Uh, and uh, again, in view of the time, unfortunately, um, uh, I need to sort of go slightly quick here. One very nice way of extracting an effective action from SYK is to take this large Q limit where the interaction and the order of the interaction is being sent to infinity. It turns out that in that case, this particular bilocal field theory of this bilocal object, basically in ordinary SYK becomes effectively a Lee will theory. That happens in ordinary SYK. And the idea is that this big object is two-point function G you write it as one plus some thing that goes to zero as one over Q. And then once you insert this in, in the SYK interaction term with this, this G to the Q thing, at large Q becomes the exponential of this phi field. So this is how you get the Liouville action. Turns out that also then in that same limit, you get a quadratic kinetic term. Um, it's a bit more subtle what to do with the E field, but if you assume that you can kind of use a mean field approximation, effectively you end up with this um, theory for the Goldstone modes of this SYK model. Uh, and again, in this, so what it looks like, it looks like two Liouville theories, one for the one psi field and one for the other psi field. Uh, but uh, since the psi fields actually basically should be thought of as chiral fermions, they propagate in different directions. Uh, and from the point of view of the bilocal theory, the bilocal theory in this case is now a four dimensional theory because I started with two dimensions. If I do the bilocal theory, it lives in four dimensions. Um, I have this action. And now this action indeed has both the conformal symmetry, because this is Liouville theory, but the conformal symmetry of this act, part of the action is in the Z direction. But this part of the action has area preserving the diffeomorphism and variance in the other two directions, in the zeta direction. This term of the action has conformal symmetry in the zeta direction and area preserving different morphism invariance in the z direction. So that's the proposal for the effective dynamics of this theory that the, the Goldstone modes of this two dimensional SYK model looks like this. Let's make that assumption. Then it turns out that this action indeed has that particular symmetry, which is the area preserving different morphism symmetry. And then one can make a long story short. Basically at that point, you can write down word identities or correlation functions of the symmetry currents that generate this symmetry. And those symmetry, those correlation functions satisfy the same properties as the correlation functions of the W infinity symmetries that one has in, in graph. So that's that's the long story. I have some more slides, but I don't think that I should, I should sort of uh, elaborate too much more beyond this, because this is basically the main punchline, that once you have an action that has in some direction conformal symmetry, then then those could give rise to the vr uh, algebra part. But it also has these other directions, these zeta directions, uh, in which this part of the action has um, W infinity symmetry, which is the error preserving diffeomorphism invariance. So basically, what it means is that the graviton um, modes that Stromberger identified are essentially the stress tensor of this particular theory. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned also before, this particular four dimensional space here is not four dimensional space time. Uh, this zeta coordinate is actually twister coordinate, uh, twister, uh, it's basically twister space. Uh, so that's where this theory lives. And then, um, and then you can still make, make, a, make a dictionary. So this is at least uh, maybe, I should say, um, uh, 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 not so much showing that this is what celestial CFT is, but at least it's, it's a, a proof of, of existence, perhaps that you can sort of have structures that incorporate most of the properties that celestial safety should have. I think I should stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Herman, for a very nice talk. 
Uh, do we have any more questions? I had kind of a general question. Um, and, and probably, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a, an expert very much in this whole direction, but so, so maybe this is obvious, but um, I'm, I'm wondering how this discussion, uh, how does it fit in somehow with all the other amplitude stuff that's gone on? I mean, I mean, I mean pr prior to prior to the gravity story, that there are all these beautiful results about amplitude, flat space amplitudes, and right. amplitude hedrons, and all, you know this this huge amount of uh, formalism that that seems to underlie um, scattering, and 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 right and somehow th this should be part of the story since you could take some non non low energy limit here and get regular amplitudes is it is it sort of understood how it might fit together yeah that's a good question of course i would say your question is part of the motivation of why we went through this yeah exercise is to kind of introduce some aspect of dynamics into the story and to see how it might fit in um if you sort of would fall if one would follow if we, so partly we are making a jump here um uh, if one would follow the the amplitude slash 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 holography sort of philosophy sort of uh, in a sequential kind of way then what you would do is you would because it's sort of partly a bootstrap right so basically you take the symmetries you find the, the realizations of the symmetry you write down the the yeah you know, the analog of conformal blocks you, you find out you, you write down the things that satisfy your axioms right uh, uh, then there, then then it turns out that if you have the symmetries, then you have the representation algebra. And once you have the representation algebra, then then things like crossing or all the all the other um, uh, consistency requirements become very non-trivial. And then you try to find solutions to all the constraints that you've sort of imposed. I should say that if you start working with amplitudes, that there are certain aspects that. Um, um, uh, are still somewhat puzzling. It turns out that the, 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 some, some of the correlation functions might actually have more delta function type uh, uh, structure rather than really the usual CFD correlation function. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, in the end, one would hope that, that the celestial CFT and also the amplitude program can do something that sort of goes beyond just checking self, you know, at least mm. self consistency. And especially in ADS CFT, it was actually a rather insightful point of view that one should start thinking also about the dynamics of if it is a holographic duality and there is some dual system, what really is is that? And if and if and if some of the lessons that we're learning in in ADS CFT are correct, then then the fact that gravity or whatever is dual to gravity should have some microphysics. Yeah, that looks very different than the symmetries of the than just using the space time symmetries, right? There should be degrees of freedom. Right. That are hiding the that yeah, from which the gravitational description should emerge. Um, and 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 in celestial CFT up to now, people obviously are, are ma making use of the gravitational description to put very strong constraints on whatever the CFT is. And maybe currently, to be completely honest, that's that's currently the definition of celestial CFT. Mm -hmm. is, is yeah, what are the consistency requirements that we have to impose on these all these things, and and they are being dictated by things that we know from the book. Uh, and maybe it's too early indeed to try to go the other way. Uh, uh, but there should still be questions of bulk reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and by the way, if this if this um, SYK model, if anyone would take this SYK model as the model of say the, the, the dual theory, then the bulk reconstruction basically is the is Penrose is the Penrose transform. It's, it's essentially some form of the Penrose transform. And I can actually I have a formula where you would actually go from, from a current in the CFT to a, a point in the bulk, uh, which, is, which is possible. So, so um, 
Yeah, I don't have a direct answer, of course, to your question. Uh, and, and all these things do fit uh, all in one big framework. Uh, currently, at least people are thinking about sort of these W infinity symmetries, indeed from the point of view both of the amplitudes and from the point of view, for example, of self-dual gravity. So that might actually be in a, a, a special sector that people uh, will start studying in a little bit more detail, uh, where perhaps indeed one has sort of a minimum model of celestial CFT. Mm -hmm. Uh, where one would be able to understand all the symmetries, both from the point of view of the gravity and potentially indeed with a specific realization uh, of a boundary system. But then it's only a subsector of the, of the full dynamics. Right? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, at some point, I, I, I would also hope to be able to either have a, a, a discussion over Zoom um, about sort of some other projects I'm working on that have to do with more with black hole information. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is fun. Um, if you guys have, um, uh, yeah, if, because I have to jump out pretty quickly. Um, uh, I'll also be happy again, if there's anyone who has questions about the talk to meet at some later time again over Zoom to have a, a more informal. Yeah. Q Sounds good. Uh, so, Herman, uh, thanks a lot for the talk, and let's thank you one more time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Okay, good. Thank you.